We're live. <laughs> I forgot. I forgot I was live. Uh, 6.53. Seven minutes ahead of schedule. Uh, we're doing good. We've got, uh, we, <laughs> I have a video up today that I posted this morning or this afternoon about different ways to change, to improve, essentially boost response. Because almost everybody wants the turbo to be more responsive because, you know, Everybody wants, as soon as you step on the gas, you want to have all of that torque that the turbo offers you. My question for the NA guys is, I, I, need, instant, I need instant power. The turbo doesn't give me that. Well, yes, it does. <laughs> it gives you instant NA power. It's just that it doesn't give you instant all the rest of that power until the turbo spools up. But it's giving you all the NA power. So you're you're like an NA motor, and, and they hate it. Guys that are all motor guys hate it when I tell them this. Your motor is 100% like boost lag, turbo lag. That's what an NA motor is because it never comes on. But I digress. So we're talking about, uh, you know, you got to give people a hard time. You got to give the uh, all motor guys a hard time. Um, but with the turbo stuff there, I went over five different ways to improve the boost response. And Milo was helping me out. As you can, as you can see, he's all Milo and Maya are always part of the group. Usually they're just laying down here. Um, they're always part of the process. They were excited about being outside and running around. And we, I got to use the, um, tree for it again today because the weather's getting nice. It's a, it was all kinds of awesome today, but the five different ways that I talked about are, were, uh, Essentially, uh, three of them were ways that you would improve the low speed torque because that's what I always equate to having the turbo be more responsive is if you make more power down low, that extra torque will help spool up the turbo. Obviously, a bigger motor does that. A 6.0 is going to be much more responsive than a 4.8 or a 5.3. Um, when we talked about different cam timing, not turbo cam versus NA cam, as it were, because I don't really look at it that way. What I look at in, in the test that I showed was the test that I ran recently on that L33, and that's the truck Norris cam versus the sloppy stage two cam. And I just look at them as one being bigger than the other. They want to optimize power production. And when I say optimize power production, I'm not talking about like at one RPM because camshafts don't do that. But if you look at the camshaft as being good in this, like, you know, in this curve shape, all you've done is move the curve a little bit one way or the other. You can see that the peak torque numbers and the peak horsepower numbers were not dramatically different. The peak horsepower number is a little bit better on the sloppy stage two cam because it's a bigger cam. But it made a bunch less power down or some less power down low than the truck Norris cam did. And so neither one of those is essentially a turbo cam. The sloppy stage two cam was not built by Elgin. One of the things I pointed out in the video is that camshaft was not designed to be a turbo cam. It's just a cam. Uh, Matt had been promoting it for a long time as, as this cam works with a turbo <laughs> because all of them do. And that cam does. And, and being a 228 cam, it's big enough to run out, especially on a 4.8, to run out at a fairly high RPM. Um, it is... Uh, because it's a uh, 228 230 not a lot of split between the two um it's it, it works fairly good it works okay down low not as not real good in my opinion it's too big of a cam for a 48 but uh, unless you're trying to rev it but but it makes more power on the top and the tur and the um and the truck cam again not a turbo cam the truck norris cam obviously it's in the name is a truck cam so neither one are turbo cams but it's just i look at them as cams the one that makes more power down low has better boost response and that's exactly what happened and we saw that also with the intake manifold stuff too same same thing longer runners make more power down low so they're going to promote power production with the turbo down low and so we saw all that stuff the other thing that i like to show is because this is a constant thing that we have to battle with and that's the boost response based on temperature so i showed you two essentially just two back-to-back -back tests and showed you the big difference in low speed torque production, which is when I did this test, the comparison between those two cams, I had to get it so that the thing was like repeatable run after run. It had to have enough temperature in it that the low speed part of it was repeatable and the rest of the stuff was, was good as long as you keep the boost the same, obviously. And all, and all of that part works out. But the bottom part is very important on the turbo stuff. So if you just go, even if you, you know, load into it for, you know, a 10 or 15 seconds or whatever, and then come off of it and then roll into it. That's still not enough. Like it takes the whole run to put the temperature in it. And then you let it breathe for a second and then make another run. And then all of a sudden you have a lot more boost response. 
and this is especially important because um, we are running a fairly big turbo on that. And I wanted to do that purposely because the dyno imparts an artificial stationary load on the load in, which you don't ever see on the street. Um, even on a even on a two step, it's not loaded like that. Um, you're you're doing it artificially. Two step was one of the things that I also mentioned at the end of the video as one of the five things I didn't obviously back to back dyno test because we couldn't do that on the dyno. But you know when you're running up against some kind of rev limiter, three or four thousand RPM, wherever you set it, and then take timing away and throw a bunch of fuel at it, and then it helps build boost. That way, when you're, you release it your turbo motor art artificially already has boost ready to go. And so it has the boost spooled up kind of the way that we do it on turbo. When we do an artificial load, if you have a turbo motor, you can sometimes watch the heat building <laughs> and then watch the, because the RPMs, the dyno wants to hold the thing at an RPM. And then you can see the torque number and you can see the boost going up too, as the thing gets more and more heat in. So it's kind of cool. But those are all ways to improve. Uh, so we got camshaft, intake manifold, and displacement. And then we got heat. And what was our other thing? Oh, and turbo sizing, obviously. And the turbo sizing is a function of, it's, a, it's I think, you know, parallel basically with engine displacement. Because you would want to choose your turbo sizing with the displacement and the NA power output. That's how I look at the situation. I look at if you have an, if you have a combination you want to, let's say you have nothing and you want to make a given amount of power. Okay. I want to make a thousand horsepower. Okay. Well, how should I do that? So the, the most responsive way is going to have a big motor and a turbo that makes a thousand horsepower or 1100, let's say. So you have lots of response down low. You have enough turbo to make the number that you want to make fairly efficiently. And then everything is good with the world. When you get into compromises is when you want that thousand horsepower, but all you have laying around is four eight. So you have this thousand horsepower turbo and you also have a motor that's not going to spool up at 2000 RPM. Um, then you have to worry about making it spool better. And then you have to do things to make it spool better. Um, and some of the other things we talked about, like for guys that are drag racing, you know, two steps and, and um, the, the, uh, spool valves and um, nitrous obviously is always a fairly easy one because if you hit something with a, even just a 25 or a 50 shot down low, guys are doing it off the line. If you do that because of how much power, how much torque that is at that RPM, you're going to get a big change in spool rate from, from that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of other things that I didn't test that we could. So what I wanted to know is I wanted you guys to mention some things um, that I missed because there are obviously things when we when we were talking about temperature, I included I the temperature test that I did was just a back to back run. But you can also lump in there to a lesser extent, I think, things like, um, you know, coated exhaust and wrap stuff and, and a turbo blanket and all the things that would kind of some of those things like the turbo blanket. I think that they help to retain the heat and keep it in there. So for the next run, it's it's hot and lit up and ready to go. But also they keep the heat away from other things, which is also important because the, the turbo gets, you know, glowy hot. <laughs> and the other things that are in and around the engine compartment don't like glowy hot stuff. So that's an important safety tip. So let me know what you think. Uh, and, and then we mentioned, um, you know, multiple turbos or compounding stuff, a, a blower and a turbo work. Obviously, sequential turbos, a smaller one and then a bigger one. Uh, compound turbos to some extent also um, can can obviously have an effect on that. So there's lots of other cool stuff. And some I, I had run compound turbos and I had run compound blower and turbos, but I didn't do it specifically to improve the uh, response rate of the turbo. It's one of the things I want to do. In fact, I got a turbo from Byron at uh, VS Racing. I got a big turbo. That's what I said. I said, send me a big turbo so I can put it on a 4.8 or even the 3,800. It's too big. And then we want it to be laggy. And then I want to cure the lagginess by adding a supercharger. So that's the that's the that's the goal for that sort of thing. And so I'll, later on I'll I'll be trying that and seeing if we can make that work. I, that turbo is probably big enough to be soft, even on the 5.3 that I have. So we can cure that maybe with some some kind of positive displacement supercharger or something and and help um, show that we look, we improved the spool rate because we added you know, 150 foot pounds of torque or something down low with the supercharger, because that would, that's definitely going to do it. 
And the, the thing for me, the important takeaway for this is the, because we get this kind of stuff all the time with cam timing, you know, people talk about my thing, this is every cam is a turbo cam. And that's, I look at the cams that way, like those two cams, the sloppy stage two and the truck Norse, it could be any two cams. I, I don't even care what the specs are. If you just show me the curves on them, I can tell you which one of them is going to be more responsive for the turbo. It doesn't matter what those specs are. I don't even care. If I see one of them makes more low speed power, that one is going to have better boost response. And then we saw, just like we saw with intake manifolds and with other things, we saw that with the camshafts and that we have a camshaft that's less responsive, but makes more power on top. At any given boost level, it's still going to do that. It's going to be less responsive, but at 10 pounds or whatever, it will make more than the other cam does at 10 pounds out at the top because the boosted curves will mirror the, um, the NA curves and that will continue to happen. So again, a lot of times, like with the intake manifold and cam timing, turbo sizing, also like we were talking about with the 4.8, we got a big turbo and we're balancing the ultimate boost versus the response. A lot of times it's like a trade-off. We have to decide, you know, single plane, dual plane intake manifold, we have to decide where do you want your power production? Like what is the most important thing? That gets a lot easier on drag race applications where you have a, you either have a high stall torque converter or you have a two-step and then you're like, I don't even care what's happening down below that point, below 3000 or 4000 or wherever you're stalling the thing to or wherever you're two-stepping it to because I've just cured all the low speed lag that was inherent. So now having the big cam and having the big turbo and having the short runner intake manifold, all that stuff is fine for drag racing, but for a dual purpose car, it's it's more of a consideration because if you want to be just driving around and nail and throttle, and honestly, I think an automatic vehicle, um, 10, as long as the stall speed is right on the converter, um, the turbos tend to like that. And because they, again, it's, it's kind of an artificial load, you, you can roll into it, you're at a higher stall speed, and I, I think that that works out pretty well. One of the reasons Grand Nationals may, you know, work really well, um, the Turbo Trans Ams work really well. Okay, so that's that. One of the other interesting comments that I got before I get to questions is, and everybody hit the like button, yes. The One of the questions I got was, or one of the comments I got is when, when asking for other things that affect the spool rate, a few people said um, boost controllers. And the reality is that a boost controller doesn't, change the way that the turbo spools up. And I know that people are going to jump all over that and say, yeah, it does. Cause I, I've seen the tests where, you know, it improves the spool up. What the boost controller does, let's say that we, all a boost controller can do is regulate opening and closing of the wastegate. So what a boost controller, an electronic boost controller does that makes people say that it improves the spool rate of the turbo is if you have it set at 10 pounds of boost, it will hold the wastegate closed until you have that 10 pounds of boost. So what it's going to do is improve the, the spool rate of the turbo only from the point where that wastegate might've been open a little bit where the turbo was already coming up. So it already had boost and it was going between wherever that spring opening rate would be to open up just a little bit and whatever point the wastegate controller was just holding it closed. So in between those two points, you know, way up here, right, like right close to where the wastegate is going to open anyway, the, the boost controller will help spool response right in that very short, narrow range of RPM. The boost controller, even if, I mean, the wastegate, even if it's closed, even if we took the wastegate off and just capped the end of it, so there's no wastegate, that's going to have no effect on what's happening before that little point where the wastegate controller was holding that valve closed. Because if the valve's closed all the way, nothing happens to the turbo down here. It didn't improve that spool rate at all. It didn't do anything. The, it didn't do anything like what displacement did. It didn't do anything like what cam timing did. It didn't do anything like what runner length did. It didn't do anything like what nitrous would do if we, if we ran nitrous down at that low RPM. It doesn't do that. So does a boost controller help spool rate? Technically, yes, but but only in that very, very tiny range, right near where the wastegate is being controlled. Down, down here, where the turbo is still deciding whether it's going to spool up or not, 
having the wastegate, you don't want it open, obviously, but having it closed all the way doesn't change what it's doing over here. It doesn't add, it doesn't impart any change. It doesn't do anything. It doesn't add anything to that equation. It doesn't increase the exhaust flow. It doesn't do any of that. It's not really part of the picture in that initial spool. Only when the thing is already going up and then needs to be controlled by the wastegate controller, is there any effect from a wastegate controller? And a lot of guys don't realize that. They think, oh, I put a wastegate controller on it. It's got, this thing is going to spool right up. No, it's not. It's still going to do the same thing except right there, right there at the end. So let's see what you guys got going on. Uh, by the way, um, Turbo Monza came, <laughs> one of his friends came and I met who was very nice, um, came and picked up the 3,800 heads. So they are on their, well, they're already up to him now. Um, he's going to take a look at them, flow them uh, in stock trim because those are basically just all stock. They had just had a valve job and, and been surfaced, I think. Um, because they, they had leaked before <laughs> when I first put them on or when I first got them from the wrecking yard. So those should be basically a good set of stock heads. He's going to flow them and we'll find out where they start out at and see how they compare to the numbers, the 184 uh, CFM numbers that I got when I flowed the head that I flowed. And then we'll see what happens when they poured them. Um, we're also talking about maybe putting uh, bigger valves in it as well to see, just kind of see what happens. So I'm, I'm interested to see what goes on there and, and how much of a gain we get. The other thing is I talk to, I have, as you know, I have um, friends in the, and this will be interesting. I have friends in the cam industry <laughs> and talk to some of them about doing a custom cam for me. And so that's going to happen. I have a cam that I spec'd out that I'm doing top secret, super Richie spec, uh, <laughs> semi race, big bang, 3,800 cam. That's a really long name. I'm going to have to trim that down a little bit. Um, and the, the interesting thing is because of the core that they have that they're using, um, I was not able to get the combination of lift and duration and LSA, um, not able to get the valve lift that I wanted. I can get, um, so what we're doing is we're, May we, when I say we, he, they are making a camshaft um, designed to work with one nine ratio rockers so that I can get the lift that I want with the duration that I want and the LSA that I want to work with this combination. And, and really, honestly, the NIC cam was pr probably enough because we were already making pretty good power. I think we were already making enough power to keep turning the boost up and get where we needed to be um, to find out whatever the limit of the breaking point of something was, whether it's a piston or a rod, that's what I suspect will happen after we put ring gap and stuff in it. Um, but it will have ported heads and uh, some kind of custom camshaft in it. So, so it'll be kind of interesting. Um, and then after that gets done, I'll let you guys know, um, uh, obviously, the thing is now, I because of the change in rocker ratio and stuff, I can't really run a direct comparison between that and something else. All I can do is put the, um, I might be able to put, but I've already sold the heads though. So I can't, I, I don't think I can really do that. I don't think I could do some kind of direct back-to-back -back comparison between that and something else. So I have to put the heads on and the camshaft and the, and the intake manifold and just kind of see where we are. Um, I think that that will, that's what will have to happen. It, it is a, it is a turbo cam by the way. Well, it will be, it's not yet. It, it will first be an NA cam cause we'll run an NA and then it will transmogrify into a, uh, turbo cam. Uh, a boost control that pressurized the top and bottom of the diaphragm simultaneously until boost targets met will respond better. You you didn't listen to what I was saying. <laughs> I said that it does only right at the very end. It doesn't do anything. Like I said, if we just close, if we just take the wastegate out of the situation and put a cap over it and then watch how the boost response comes up, a boost controller can't make it any better than that can't do anything. All it does is open and close the gate. That's all it can do. 
Um, and I'm talking about a, a three port or a four port that, that has control over the top and the bottom. Even if we hold it shut, even if we just put a line to the top of the gate so that it's holding it close, <laughs> it will not change what happens before the turbo spools up to whatever the um, spring rate is in the in the diaphragm, and, and I mean, in the wastegate. It only helps a little bit at the end. It does not change the way the turbo spools up. A single port gate will definitely do that. That if you just have a, a like a manual controller or whatever, or even electronic controller that's just going to the bottom of the gate, that doesn't hold the gate closed. That just opens the gate. That that will, um, depending on what your spring rate is and what your desired boost pressure is, um, it will start to open. And and also depending on what your back pressure is, it will start to open based on back pressure. Uh, put CO2 on the gates. It, the CO2 doesn't do anything to the gates. It doesn't. All it does is hold them closed. It won't change the response rate until you get up to the point where it's opening the gate. Like I said, forget about gates. Forget about what you think is happening with the gates. What if you have no no wastegate there? You just have a skull and crossbones cap over that. What happens to the response rate of the turbo? Nothing. It still does what it does. It still comes up the same. Uh, if you were to polish the outside of the hot side of the turbo, would that hold heat in? I, I think that kind of thing, you're probably splitting hairs. Testing my Gen 1 Turbo Coyote Fox on Sunday. Oh, cool. A Coyote and a Fox. Nice. I'm using a Borgwar S475, 8373 exhaust wheel, 110 T6. So far, trans brake is showing three PSI. Your thoughts on that turbo? Are you going to run it? Are you testing it at the track? Or are you, you're not testing it on a, on a dyno, right? An 8373 Borg Warner is probably going to be like a sub thousand horsepower deal. What about a turbo small enough to not put a blow off valve and just spin it till it stops spinning faster? The blow off valve just opens up when the throttle valve is closed to stop the big pressure spike. So maybe you're talking about a wastegate. Uh, will you do any spool valve testing? I don't know. I don't have a setup for that because I don't have a divided um, Y pipe and a divided turbo. Uh, and a divided flange to feed that into, and then and then a spool valve to redirect that. Uh, what size small block do you prefer? I don't prefer anything. It doesn't matter. Just whatever you can get is fine. I'm just saying that if you, lots of guys are making lots of power with four eights, five threes, six O's, whatever you can get, I'm just the the point of the video was that the bigger the motor, the more responsive the turbo is going to be with the bigger motor. So if that's what you want, that's the way to get it. A rapid fire question, one word answer is most important thing for a turbo motor, blower motor, and NA motor. I don't know, is that is that more than one word? Is a T70 a bunch smaller than the eBay GT45? You'd have to give me the specs on the wheels to really determine that. But I know that the T70, like the CX Racing T70 and the T76 is smaller than the GT45, or at least it made less power than that. Pressure ratio has to do with ambient pressure divided by boost. If you're at altitude and your ambient pressure is lower, the ratio is different than at sea level. Uh, GT3076 on the 3800, low boost with rabbit spool. Y yeah, that would help um, on the 3800. Unfortunately, we're not trying to do that. 
I may do that. I may run some smaller turbos on the 3800 just to see how it responds before we do all of it. I have a 2500 HD 2003 with an LP4 on a low-end turbo setup for it. There's lots of turbos. that The GT45 is pretty good for that, for a six liter, if you want to run like seven pounds or something. What's the most boost you've seen put to a true stock 302 block? I'm going to run a 7875 with GT40P heads. Uh, I don't know. I don't really go by boost. Um, so I don't know what the answer to that is. Uh, I haven't run a lot of boost on a on a five liter, like a late model hydraulic roller block. I'm just going to go from a 2,500 stall to a 3,000. I'm bumping into seven PSI now. So 3,000 will get me there anymore. Yeah, Mike, that's true. The The one thing that people don't realize is if you take a jump up in... Um, stall speed and then therefore boost if that's what's happening then you start getting into the issue is can you put all that power down yeah okay you're making more and with when a, with a turbo motor and you make a jump like that like with an na motor you make a jump of 500 rpm especially in the lower range you're not talking about a big change in power but on a turbo motor if you go from three pounds to seven pounds or eight pounds you're talking about a really big change in torque oh the pole tonight i have not put the pole up there So I know it will ask. Will a there we go. Uh, will an electronic boost controller change the spool rate of the turbo? And our poll is up. Uh, Matthew, I don't remember what your original question was. I was trying to sc scroll back and look at it. <laughs> yep, time for the poll. Uh, five, Michael, 5.3 liter, 800 horsepower goal, looking for a single turbo with good response without back pressure. Uh, uh, I'd have to do it. Do they have maps for the 472 and the 471? I mean, is there the, is there that much difference between them? I don't I don't know if they have maps for both of them. What's your favorite kind of racing to participate in? Um, road racing has been my favorite stuff. Can you do an M20 BMW Big Bang? I don't think I've ever run a BMW motor on the dyno. Will you test the five liter motor? What do you mean? Will I test it for running lots of boost on it? That's that's not planned, if that was your question. <laughs> it can change it negatively. Yes, it can, that's right. So grooves and land, I want you to explain to me how it's affecting boost control, how it's affecting the spool rate of the turbo, other than a, that very narrow range where the wastegate is, where the wastegate is trying to be pushed open by the back pressure and it stops that from happening. Other than that very like last little bit, um, it doesn't affect, like let's say that that's happening at 4,000 RPM. The waste, the electronic wastegate does nothing at 2000. It also does nothing at 3000. It also probably does almost nothing at 3500. Only right near where it's opening and closing the gate does any of that happen. So that's what I mean. That's what I'm talking about the spool rate is that the, the spool rate of the turbo is determined by 
the sizing of the turbo and the power output of the NA motor. How much like exhaust heat, obviously, as we saw from the thing, heat and energy is applied to the turbo. That's what determines pull rate. Uh, how important is quench clearance in an NA motor? You need to have that. <laughs> it's very important. If the piston hits the head, that's really bad. Uh, Matthew, yeah, I've tested a lot of five liter stuff. I that was actually the first book that I wrote was on five liter performance. I don't even I don't know if there's any. Honestly, now that's an interesting question. I don't know if there's any turbo stuff in that book. I don't know if I tested any turbo five liter stuff back then. I think it was probably mostly supercharged stuff. Um, I ran a lot of Vortex stuff back then. Uh, have you done tested a turbocharged Godzilla? I have not. I haven't run any Godzilla motors. Uh, Matthew, your first drag build. Take a look at the five liter stuff that I have up. It's pretty easy to make pretty decent power out of those things. David, I'm doing a Chevy 292. Want to run boost? We ha I have a video up where we did that. Factory cast iron heads, my only option. Short block is nine to one compression. We ran a turbo on one of those already, and it works just fine. <laughs> the pissing hitting the head is just your engine clapping for you. The problem is that that applause goes away. <laughs> it doesn't keep doesn't keep clapping. Can we have a throwback video in the backyard? Yeah, the I, I'll be doing more out there because it's really nice. As a matter of fact, I was just out um, mowing the lawn to get all the, the grass is getting pretty high back there. Uh, how, Brad, that's a good question because I, I don't really know the answer to it. I, I think none, but how much does intake volume have an effect to spool? Seems like less should be more responsive. <laughs> People look at, tend to look at the volume of the intake manifold as way more than it is because they seem to think that it takes a, a lot of time to fill that up with charge air from a turbo or a blower or NA. And they also think that that reservoir that's in there when the engine's breathing, it's got that extra volume in there so that the engine doesn't run out. <laughs> Neither one of those things are real. Uh, what I want you to do is do the calculations, figure out how much power you have, Determine how much CFM that is, and you can use uh, a good one is one and a half to one per horsepower. Figure how many cubic feet per minute you're running at whatever RPM you want to test this at, and then get a rough idea on the volume of the intake manifold and figure out in how many seconds, in how many portions of a second, you're evacuating everything that's in that plenum. And then you'll realize that, hey, that's not an extra volume. Also, it also doesn't take a really big time to fill that either. So do that math and it will surprise you because I know it did for me. How much quench clearance uh, do I have for a 408 short block with a flat top piston? I want to lower the compression. Well, where is the piston? Is it down in the hole? What is the thickness of the gasket? What is the, the head won't matter um, because that, that's going to be kind of fixed. Um, know that lots of OEMs have run pistons, I don't know, 80, 90, 100 thousandths down in the hole. And it still works. It's not ideal, but it still works. Um, I wouldn't want to get too close because the piston rocks and things grow. And so normally about 30, I think, is, is kind of the range that people wanted at. Uh, do you use China parts? I don't know what you mean by that. Could you do a fuel injector recipe video for popular engine displacements and boost levels like a quick re reference guide? 
I already did the video showing you how to determine what size injector you need. And that's all you need. If you, if you know, and you'll know more than I will, what power output you want, then you just pick your cor injector and correlating. If it's an NA, you just multiply the flow rate by 16. That tells you what that injector will support. What about a rear turbo set up on a truck? They don't really see much spool loss. Um, they do. It's less. But again, people think that it has to fill all that up. And it's not... <laughs> It's not empty. It's not a vacuum. <laughs> um, and I did uh, I did rear mounted turbo tests and there is lag. I, admittedly, mine was gigantically long. It was 12 feet or something or 14 feet or something. It's just ridiculous. Much more than it is actually in a truck in a rear mount kind of thing. Um, but they work well. And the, you know, I remember and I can remember I was talking to Jimmy from HP about this. I said, you know, remember. I remember when they first offered their first modular Ford kit and they put the turbos up kind of to the side of the radiator in the behind the bumper away from the engine and the tube going up there from the their header that they made was really long. I'm like, wow, those are that's really far away. That's not going to be responsive at all. And, you know, <laughs> knowing what we know now, we're like, yeah, we would put them there every time because it was convenient and it was, it was cool there and it worked good. And, you know, and that's the thing you learn as you go and you realize that all these things that you've read in all of these turbo books and stuff about a turbo needs to be as close to the exhaust valve as it possibly can. That's just nonsense. That's not, it's not real world. Um, you know, maybe if it, you had to have the, the last, micro fraction of a second of boost response that you're trying to do and you want to do that stuff, that's fine. But we've seen stuff really far away and we've seen that work pretty well. And so anything in between that and having it mounted next to the exhaust valve, all of that stuff will work. Uh, what heads and cam would you recommend for a 400M and a 78 Bronco four speed with 40s on it? I don't know what you're trying to do with it. Um, you can put any kind of Cleveland head on there. We ran aluminum heads on it. You could put a 2V Aussie head on there. Um, you need to get a, um, a good piston for that, though. Our, ours were down in the hole, and I think we tried using a Cleveland piston, too, and I think that that one was also down in the hole. So if you can cure that, there are actually lots of good aluminum heads. Trickflow makes a Cleveland head. Edelbrock makes a Cleveland head. I think we used a Speedmaster one that um, Dr. Jays did. So you have a lot of options there. Uh, Richards, who's three bar map sensor you normally use? I think we have the Holly, just normal square ones on the, on the one, two and three bar stuff. We also use the GM stuff, um, that plugs right into the harnesses that are, that are, you know, kind of GM specific, like the, the Holly HP stuff that we have. So we run the factory one bar stuff that that's, you know, basically plugged into the intake manifold. And I think that there's also a two and a two and a half bar one that are factory GM ones. Uh, a lot of big straight eight parts. Cool. Uh, regarding volume on my CR450X, it made 35 horsepower on the dyno stock with a 20 millimeter restrictor between the carburetor and the head. Why wouldn't you put the restrictor in front of the carburetor? It dropped to 18 horsepower, adding a 1200 cc reservoir between the restrictor and the head. Fix the power. So on the other side of the restrictor, that, that seems odd to me. Wait, you said that too fast. I was going to go 80, an 85 pound injector will support 85 times 16 will support 1360 horsepower NA. And actually it will support a little more than that because that's a, that's at a 0.5 brake specific. 
So under boosts, conservatively, uh, they'll support a thousand. And then on E85, less than that, probably more like 700. Uh, Richard, what are LS3 ported heads worth on a full build stage three cam? Um, I, I don't know what the motor is. And I don't know what stage three cam it is. And I don't know what intake it is. And I don't know what compression it is. I don't know any of that stuff. The, if you take a look at the video that I have up on all of the, on all the LS3 heads, I tested, I don't know, 10 or 15 of them. You can kind of see what ported heads are worth. And you can see what they're worth on a really big NA motor, on a really big, powerful NA motor. I tested a set of ported LS3 heads on a stock LS3, and they were worth 10 horsepower. So somewhere in between 10 horsepower and whatever the good ones were worth in the head test on, on a 468 that was making lots of power, um, that will tell you. Uh, what do you think of Texas speed camshafts? Your personal opinion that that question isn't phrased properly. That's assuming that every Texas speed cam is the same and that you're you're just asking me my opinion of a supplier. And that's not an accurate question. I've tested many Texas speed cams and all the cams work the way that cams of that spec should actually work. So the the camshaft doesn't know. Uh, whose name is on it, <laughs> as long as it was ground properly. Uh, do you have a larger 1900 or TVS or twin screw to test on the 3800? I, I have a Kenny Bell twin screw that is a, I think I have a 2.8 liter Kenny Bell, but it but I'd have to make some sort of adapter to make it work on there. Uh, off the top of your head, do you know the top limit of the LT1 direct injectors max out? I don't know that. I, I don't know enough about the Gen 5 flow rates and what they're getting at. I don't even know if the LT1, I would think that the LT1 would be a different injector than an L83. But since I don't know what either one of them are, it doesn't really help us. I know the LT4 is kind of the go-to upgrade injector for guys running boost. And I thought that that combined with the... Uh, a lobe on the pump and maybe a pump upgrade was something in the 850 horsepower range. How about building motor that has three and a half inch to four inch piping from the intake to one end of a 30 gallon drum? <laughs> I can already tell. Uh, with a large throttle body mounted to the other end, so it would be a huge plenum. You mean like the the Keglodon? Uh, boost pressure reduces injector flow due to the in intake manifold pressure fighting the fuel pressure. Yeah, that's called delta. So you have to have the same delta pressure for the flow rate to be the same. So what most people do is, is like he was saying, is you boost reference the regulator so that the fuel pressure goes up in relation to boost so that you always have the delta pressure that the injector is rated at. Yeah, saying everything it comes out of China is bad is not accurate. I, I've used lots of stuff from there that works good. I've used stuff that doesn't work good. I've used, it, it would be like saying that everything that's made in the United States is good. That's also 100% not accurate. Uh, what automatic trans options would be considered? I don't know. I'm not really a transmission guy. But can't they make the a, a C6 or whatever the automatic version of a Ford C6 is?
Well, Gruz, I, I understand what you're saying, but if you're saying that having a reservoir there is enough to feed the motor with a restrictor in place, eventually that's a constant loss system. And it's going to run out of, you're going to, you're going to create a vacuum in the reservoir because there's no way if the, if it can't fill, if the restrictor can't fill what the motor is, if it restricts the motor, it's going to restrict filling the reservoir also. So after how many ever cycles, it's going to use up all of whatever the extra was in that reservoir. And again, that's fairly easy to calculate based on the power output and the airflow and stuff. It, that would be a constant loss system. I, I'm curious as to why that, that would even show power. Uh, hey, can you tell us about bypass valves? One of the Gen 1 Insight guys used one to utilize lean burn, I guess, at lower RPM crews. I'm still hunting for a tiny turbo if anyone knows where I can hook it up. So is it a, a, an Insight isn't turbocharged, right? It's an NA motor. And if he's opening a bypass valve and he's opening it, farther than the throttle blade is? Is he introducing more air that's not being registered? Is he bypassing the, is he using a bypass valve to somehow bypass the air around the, um, around the mass air meter or whatever is um, measuring the airflow into the motor? Uh, Jeff Smith, Texas Speed has good stuff. I, all the cams that I've used from Texas Speed have all worked good. So along with ring gap, one should add one pound, one, one PSI fuel pressure and reduce ignition time by one degree per pound of boost. Uh, I don't know where that comes from. I don't know where that math comes from. The fuel pressure certainly is accurate. You, for every pound of boost, and, and that's easy to do. You don't add it. You just hook a reference line up to the fuel pressure regulator, and the system does that for you already. Um, normally, it, it's sensing, and it will still do that if your reference line is going to the intake manifold after the throttle body. When you decel and get a lot of vacuum in there, it will, it will also reduce the fuel pressure, which is what you want under cruise. Um, and then it will increase it with boost. That's easy to fix. I don't know about the one degree per pound of boost thing. I, I don't know where you get that from. Uh, good question to ask. Not sure if you got to feel how the power was produced in the remote turbo. I didn't ride in the truck, so I don't know. Um, how much did the remote mount affect spool up on that setup? I don't know because we don't. We would have to compare it to something else. So whatever the spool up is could be a function of that turbo. Um, and, unless you also ran that same turbo closer to measure boost response and then data log it, hopefully, so that we're not just relying on, hey, it seemed like it was better or whatever. Uh, wastegates on exhaust housings. I I think that that's probably mostly for packaging, I'm thinking. Uh, how fast did your El Mirage Civic? It was Bonneville, actually. I don't think I ran it at El Mirage. Um, but we weren't worried about spool rate. We had a 72 millimeter turbo on there. And we couldn't put power down until the very top of fourth year, until 7,500 or 8,000 RPM in fourth year. And then we basically had fifth gear to run it in. So all I wanted the thing to do is basically to have boost, um, and it had a slightly rising curve, to have boost uh, once we were in VTEC, and it did have that. Uh, did I ever go over to Todd's house and pull the engine? I have not yet um, because he he wasn't feeling well. They think they changed his meds, and so he's um, he's readjusting to that. 
chasing random, chasing random wiring issues is awful. It is. I agree. I wiring is not my thing. So if someone has an S10 with roof mounted turbos. That's a good place to put them up there because then they look like um, they look like police lights. And plus, you get good airflow in them. Fred, thank you very much. Uh, how do you figure how much ring gap per boost up to 30 pounds? The boost number is not really an issue. It's um, we do it based on bore size. So seven thousandths or so per uh, inch of bore is the, the way that I do it. Um, Steven, you were talking about the Keglodon intake question. How does an engine know the difference between plenum volume versus runner volume? Both are air between the throttle binding heads. Actually, um, the runner volume is part of the plenum volume. The Hemholtz resonance frequency, that's the, that's the vibrating frequency of the plenum, which, which produces pressure waves that go in and help cylinder filling. That's the volume. But the volume is not just what's inside the plenum. It's the it's the runner volume. It's actually the length of the inlet tube in front of that. It's the runner going down, including the head. And then actually, when the valve is open, it's actually half of the of that cylinder. Also, all of that is the resonating volume. Runner length produces a different thing. Runner length produces a different kind of pressure wave called the reflected wave, and that's when a negative pressure wave comes up from the open intake valve goes up into the plenum, expands out. That's called rarefication or rarefaction. And when you expand out a negative pressure wave, it creates a negative pressure zone. And then since nature abhors a vacuum, positive pressure fills that and then sends a positive pressure wave back down the inlet track into the open valve, hopefully occurring when the piston is at or near bottom dead center when there's not any cylinder filling going on anymore. And then all of a sudden it got this supercharged version of pressure wave and that's the intake runner. And so they do different things. And of the two of them, you should concentrate on runner length and not plenum volume. Yeah, seven thousands per inch of bore. Uh, the Chrysler first cross ram was an attempt to work with tuned length and Hemholtz resonance. How did that work out? They actually didn't have much of a resonating volume on their, on their really long, but they had is like three feet of runner length though. And so they had an intake that was designed to make peak power at <laughs> peak torque anyway, at 2000 RPM. And that's why they ended up shortening it because <laughs> they wanted more RPM. It's pretty cool. I got to see one of those run at West Tech. Um, it was on a bigger, it was on a 495 inch motor, I think, um, with that intake manifold on there and two carburetors on there. And while you're making the run, you could see the fuel standoff raise above the carburetor and then come back down. <laughs> it's really pretty cool. Fuel standoff coming out of the carburetor is probably not a good idea. In 82, GM did a cross ram with TBIs. They, it continued in, to, in the Camaro in 83, and also in the 84 Corvette, they kept that L33, no, L83 um, cross ram motor, first appeared in the 82 Corvette. I, I want to run one of those. I, I like that setup. Uh, 502 Ramjet intake horsepower capability, a, a lot especially if you run boost on it. Oh, NA, yeah. I, I don't know. The intakes are not rated on power, really. Um, if, you, if you did a flow test on it, which I've never done, and then if you told me what the intake runner length was, I could kind of give you an idea on where it would want to make power. So its horsepower limiting properties might be less a function of flow rate than they are of where that thing wants to make power. If the intake runners are shorter, even if they flowed exactly the same, it's going to make more power because it's going to want to make power at a higher engine speed. And then the higher engine speed is going to allow it to make more power. 
Do I retard the cam at the timing chain for low end power? No, you would advance the cam if you want to do that. It's amazing how fast air flows in the runners and fills a piston in thousands of a second at 8,000 RPM. You guys, if you guys haven't seen it, you need to look up John Causey's, um, uh, what is it, the AETC conference, um, where he made a clear runner and stuck his finger in it with a hole. And and you can see the, you can see these reflected waves and stuff just wiggling his finger like it's oscillating as fast as you might imagine. It looked like it was going to break his finger. It was really, really cool. It's the first thing I've seen that actually demonstrates what's going. You can't even you can't even use smoke and stuff to do it because it's happening too fast. But you can see when he sticks his finger in there because everybody thinks that the runner, like <laughs> they envision the air rushing into the intake manifold and then I don't know distributing evenly into all these runners, and that's not at all what's happening. So if you see when when you see that in, and he puts it into perspective, you see all the chaos that's actually happening inside an intake. It's really it's really amazing. Yeah, the the, the people ask me all the time. The when I was doing a lot of intake designing and stuff, and just custom stuff that I was doing adjustable intake manifolds, they're all like. Yeah, well, what does it flow? I'm like, yeah, I don't know. I don't I don't even care. It doesn't matter to me. What I'm testing has nothing to do with flow. Well, how do you know how much power it's going to make? I said, watch what it does. Oh, wow, that's really cool. I wonder what it flows. I'm like, I, I just want to strangle you. Uh, Dean, I emailed you 12 hours ago to tell you the runner length thing for, say, a GM. I don't know. What, what, what were you telling me about it? Were you giving me calculations or something? I'm, I'm scrolling, I'm scrolling, I'm scrolling. I don't see anything. I'll have to go back and look and see and see what it said. Did you did you give me the answers to all of my my intake manifold questions? Yep, still not, still not, still not seeing it. Nope, I'm not seeing it. Uh, let's see. I've seen intakes with a horizontal divider in the intakes. Uh, random thought. Would a carved TPI or LT1 be any better than a similar original small block Chevy? I don't know what you mean. I don't know wh why, why do you think one of those would be better? The amount of power that a motor makes is a function of the displacement and the compression and the cam timing and the head flow and stuff. Um, one thing isn't inherently better than the other. If you modify all of those things, then I, I would assume that they could probably make the same power. The one thing I do like about the LT1 is reverse cooling. Yeah, there. Somebody was mentioning being oversized on the injectors, and obviously that's also a problem. Um, like we were talking about with picking a, a thousand horsepower turbo on a small motor, you have to look at both sides of it. It can make a thousand horsepower, but you also have to worry about response rate down low. Same thing with an injector. You know, if you want to just put a two or three thousand cc injector in there and go, I'll always have enough. Yeah, but on the other side of that, on the on the front side, where streetcars spend 90% of their time, you're you're having to start and idle and drive around and go through the drive through to get your biggie fries and all that. And if the injector is so large and your engine is so small, that's the big problem with having a little motor that you're trying to make a lot of power with. Not only turbo sizing becomes problematic, but also injector sizing, because you need an injector that will support a thousand horsepower for your turbo Honda but you also need an injector that will allow you to drive around and idle on a ostensibly a low compression four-cylinder motor. 
that doesn't need hardly any fuel. It helps that you go to E85 or methanol because at least that needs more fuel flow. But if you get down to the point where you can't open and close the injector in a short enough like pulse width, it's just not going to work. You and then and a lot of times injectors have a range where they're effective in. They don't like to have some of them don't like to have really low like duty cycles. They don't like that. They don't work well. Um, and then you know people have talked about not wanting to go to a hundred percent duty cycle. I've done that a lot on injectors and. I, and in fact, I did it when we did the silver state, the injectors were at 100% duty cycle and they had 100 PSI. So all the bad things and it, and yet it still worked. Would there be any advantage you're running a larger than recommended for X engine AR and standing mile application? Uh, as long as you're not concerned as much with the launch, um, a lot of times if you, if your turbo is so responsive and you have to take, I call them countermeasures, <laughs> like in submarine moves, if you have, uh, countermeasures or, or in planes, if you have to do countermeasures, take timing away, take boost away or whatever for the launch, cause you can't put that power down. Your, the amount of response that you have, there's wasted anyways. So you might as well put a bigger turbo on there that has a, um, you know, a bigger hot side and not have to worry about that and then have the benefit later on. That's one of the reasons, the other reason that we did that on the Bonneville Civic is we had less boost pressure than back pressure. And that makes the turbo more efficient. It will make more power that way. As it turned out, we never turned the boost up anywhere near all the way, not even really halfway <laughs> when we were running Bonneville. But, um, you know, it, it just makes it more efficient for what we were trying to do. If we were drag racing, then we would have done something different. Uh, dual injectors is the other way you can do stage injectors, small ones. And then, and, and that was fairly common in formula one too. They had, um, small injectors down by the ports so that they could run and do yellow flag laps and stuff. And then they had the injectors up top on top of the stacks so that they could get lots of fuel and then also charge cooling from the fuel. Yeah, John. Uh, <laughs> John was telling me about that experience when I was at because I was um, I was helping host the the ATC conference when he did that um, demonstration, and he said we yeah, we eventually I said dude you, how how many times did you stand there he goes yeah we thought about it and it was not really a good idea so they made like a um, I think it was an aluminum or steel blast plate between them and the motor when they were doing it. So when they were filming it, so, I mean, that's smart. You don't, we don't want to lose John. Um, and so that was really smart of them to do it. Cause even, even standing in the dinos, we've done it a few times. It gets kind of iffy. Anyone have experience with swapping out the crossfire system with a regular carb and intake setup? It, it, it's really easy. It's just like swap, swapping out a tune port. We've done that many times. Um, what we did on the tune port motor is take all that stuff off, take that computer control distributor out, put a carburetor, put an intake manifold on there, put a distributor on there that has a normal weights and stuff. And then it's just a carbureted small block. Yeah, uh, Travis, that's how uh, motorcycles, they're, they're doing that also, which is what cars should kind of do. I'm surprised. I, maybe the new GM does that too. Um, if you inject air, the farther you get it away from the valve, um, you know, put it high up in the runner, it has charge cooling effect and it, and, and it adds power. Uh, Braden, I don't know what fuel, I don't know what the spec fuel is for Formula One right now. Casey's saying unleaded pump gas. I have a 2650 if you're interested in running on a 3800. The, the blower isn't the problem. Um, doing all the fabricating necessary to put a blower on the 20 on the 3800, you have to build a, an adapter for it. Yeah, well, and, and more than that, you'd have to build an adapter with a box to run some kind of intercooler on it. Because if you were running a blower that big, because I have that 2800, it already has a it already has an intercooler as part of the assembly. It was for an LS3. I could bolt it on to the 3800 if I made the the other part of the manifold that went from that to the 3800. 
but I'm not interested in doing that <laughs> because some things just because I can doesn't mean that I should. And that would be a lot of time and effort to build a one-off thing that I'm just going to take off and then put the turbo on and then do the big bang on. And that's not really smart of me anyway. Not everything is direct injected. Yeah, the um, GM went with that on the LT5 motor. They they did both. Do you have any experience or downtime with GM PP CNC LS3 heads? I do. I ran those on a some kind of LS3 that we had. I ran them stock, and they added about 10 horsepower. And then I use those in the big head test. If you look at the big LS3 head test video that I have up, they're in that as well. <laughs> Oops, wrong video. <laughs> I think, uh, uh, Travis, I think on the LT5, they were worried about um, the buildup on the valves. And it and it, and I think it added power too. Two more minutes, officially. <laughs> yeah, they're worried. They were only worried about the valves on the LT5s, not all the other motors. <laughs> Yep, Tom, two more minutes. Oh, Jose, you lost connection? Loved your recent original 5.7 LS1 mods video. Yeah, all the guys from Australia were complaining that I don't do 5.7 LS1s. And I, I actually, all of the testing that I did when I first started with LS, LS, engine families. It was all LS1 because Westec had two of those that, that Tom uh, and I got running and were able to do a bunch of testing with. So I did a bunch of them on that. And then I got an LS2 after that. Yes, hit the thumbs up. So I'm going to go ahead and close the... It's interesting. Will an electronic boost controller change the spool rate of the turbo? 37% saying yes, 63% saying no. Interesting. So we'll close that out. 164 votes. Uh, James, what do you think of the Terminator X? Well, your, your second part of your comment there shows that you don't know what goes on here at this channel. Because <laughs> I don't give you reviews. I don't give you promotion for, for somebody's product. I do testing. Um, that being said, I've never run a Terminator X. The only Holly that I've run is an HP or a Terminator, which are exactly the same for what I'm doing anyway. Uh, I think that the Terminator would be the same in terms of me being able to tune it. But I don't do enough stuff to really put any of the, I also do, I've also done fast and I have the MS3 Pro, but I don't do enough with it other than change the air fuel and change the timing and on the MS3 Pro, change the cam timing. So I don't do enough with the systems to really push the systems to the limit to figure out which one's better. They'll all change the air fuel. They'll all change the timing and they would all change the um, variable cam timing if I had those systems of the MS3 Pro, we we're using that on the 4200 Atlas motor. So they all did exactly what I asked. They all did exactly what I wanted. None of them were that hard to learn. Um, I've been doing the Holly stuff for a long time. It's pretty intuitive and I think it's pretty user friendly because if I can learn it, I'll, I'll, <laughs> really almost anybody can. Um, and, it, and I use it all the time. So that's why I use it because I use it all the time. <laughs> Turbocharged mechanical fuel injection. Back in the top fuel days, they were doing that. They were trying that stuff. And also the Can-Am stuff, they were trying that. Uh, what would be the hardest thing to overcome? Mechanical fuel injection is usually pretty easy to get working 
at wide open throttle, uh, at park throttle, and at idle, but not all three of those. And then with the turbo, Brulee is actually pretty good at mechanical fuel injection. Um, if you have all of the things there to adjust, you can get stuff done. But we see those systems a lot out at Bonneville. And they, I don't know if they don't have the right guys tuning them, but they seem to be problematic. Uh, how programmable is electronic boost controller system that the pole is based on? You can have it be as adjustable as you want. You can you can have the most elaborate boost controller system in the world, and it will still do exactly what I just said. <laughs> it will hold the it will it can't do anything more than hold the wastegate closed so the turbo comes up, but it has no effect <laughs> on the turbo coming up over here. It only has an effect on the turbo coming up here where it starts to impart back pressure on the system to want to open that valve and the controller says hey i'm not going to let you open that valve because you're not at a high enough boost yet and then once it reaches the boost level that it wants the wastegate to be open at it will do that so it only affects it right there it has no effect down here and there's nobody in the world that can convince me otherwise Uh, Porsche 91730 is another example. Mechanical fuel injection, the turbo is nearly undrivable during part throttle. <laughs> um, I, I remember I had the, there's really good stories about that with, um, in the Mark Donahue book about them <laughs> sending the motor over and putting it in and the, they couldn't get the thing to like start and idle and run because the, when they, had, when they, when Porsche had done that, they'd only done full throttle tuning. <laughs> So the thing wouldn't start and run and drive around. And they're like, hey, we, as good as Mark Donahue is, he's not at wide open throttle on every turn. Um, so it's, it's a really good series of what they did. And then the, the and they talk about when the engineers were there from Porsche, oh, this is the most powerful engine in the world. And this is the greatest thing ever. And then, um, and I, and I, I'm hoping that this is true. Like I want, I don't want this just to be like a, a myth, <laughs> a legend. But after they were up there, you know, making, finally getting it to work and making laps and stuff and doing the tuning on it, um, Donahue came over to the engineer and said, is there any way we could get more power out of this? <laughs> ah, racers. Nine seventeens were nasty beasts, only work well at full throttle. Um, I watched an interview with Brian Redman on 917s about him talking about the difference between him and most drivers in the 917 30 and Donahue and, and the 917 10s, I think, too. But and then Donahue in that same car. And he was talking, and this is Brian Redman who knew how to get around. And he was talking about the difference. And I'll have to tell that story sometime about when a, another guy that's a racer is talking about another guy that's a racer. And <laughs> uh, that's really cool stuff. Mons is in the house. Uh, Fred, how many times are you? Oh, the, the Golden Gator top that was outlawed. Cool. So you've said that twice. We're not going to have that happen again, right? We don't need to keep saying that. Uh, yep. I get the oh the heads on Saturday. Okay, cool. Oh, you get the heads on Saturday. So did I didn't know where you were relative to where he was. <laughs> well, Dan, that would be that would be one way, uh, and I do have to get going. But that would be one way that the boost controller could actually help the initial response of the turbo, where the wastegate controller has no control over it, 
is if the wastegate controller was also controlling a nitrous solenoid, <laughs> then it could definitely control boost down there. Oh, so he's in Marysville, 45, 50 miles away. He's coming to work on his truck. My, oh, on, oh, on Saturday. Okay, cool. That's right. You're 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 north of that, right? Just worked on sprint car engines a little. It was actually fun to tune the Kinzer. And the Kinzer stuff on the sprint car engines, at least all of that stuff should be fairly well dialed in because they had been using it for a long time. I mean, hadn't they been running that on sprint car engines for a long time? So didn't they have um, the pills worked out and the pressure and all that stuff? James, thank you very much. What? Uh, when is the, but is a turbo cam, <laughs> when is the turbo cam short coming out? I really need to do that. Fred, thank you very much. Nitrous on turbo motor for gives a lot of sense with respect to turbo lag. It it does. It it makes a big difference. And it's one of the ways that a lot of the smaller motors, four cylinders in particular, um, can help spool up some of those big turbos. I'd actually like to see a, um, somebody mention at the Turbo Monza mentioned down like boosters. I'd actually like to see a comparison of um, of boosters on the same carburetor. That would be interesting to see what what we had to do with um, jetting and fuel response and stuff. Be interesting to try it on a single plane intake manifold. I think. Uh, are you going to use the S475 in the Big Bang? I think we're going to have to use something of that size on the 3800. I think we'll get past, I'm hoping we'll get past the um, GT45, past the power potential of that, especially with the new Super Richie cam. <laughs> I hope it works. You can also just spray fuel directly into the exhaust like the um, catfish. Well, a lot of the, the GTP car guys actually did that. Because when, especially the catfish guys, because they had the smallest motor and they were um, running lots of boost. Okay, guys, I got to get going. Thank you guys all for showing up. I've already closed out the poll. I think we're good there. Hopefully, guys, you guys have all taken a look at the video that I have up on the five <laughs> with Milo as a <laughs> as an extra. Um, the five ways to improve boost response. And um, obviously, I'm going to have to do a, a boost controller video to show people what, what they do and what they don't do. And I think I think showing the difference between I wanted to do a video on wastegates actually, and the and the boost controller would be a good part of that. Uh, I sent a message to Marty over at um, Turbo Smart about using some of his stuff. Um, I think I think it's a good way to demonstrate what's going on with wastegates is just to run them with no reference, run reference to the bottom, run a manual controller, and then run a manual controller with top and bottom because we can do that as a T the same way that they do it with a like a three port run a three port on it and then show what they actually do and, and where they're actually affecting the boost curve. So we have to run it with enough turbo to where the turbo needs to come up. And then also we always, we obviously have to monitor back pressure too, because back pressure plays a big part, especially if you're using a light spring, the lighter the spring is, the more back pressure is going to affect or want to affect what's going on with the wastegate. Um, if the back pressure gets high enough, it can actually overcome what's going on with the controller and make that not work. <laughs> That's not a good situation. I think I ran into that a couple of times. But uh, because if you run a, a line directly to just, just to the top of the gates, then they'll never open, which which the turbo will spool up all the way there. Um, we, we don't recommend that, though. And I've, we've run across situations like that where we hook things up incorrectly, and it, that that does happen. Um, but I would like to do that and show what the difference in the boost curve is 
of all of those situations so that we can talk about what's going on. You can, and you, we can do the power too, but the boosting is really going to kind of be telling and then maybe try that and demonstrate it with different spring rates, maybe go from a seven pound to a 10 pound or 15 pound or whatever, and show that when we change spring rate, it cures some of that situation um, because it makes it harder for the back pressure to, um, to overcome the spring. Um, and then what happens with uh, boost controllers um, with the dynamic range that the controller has. So like, let's say you want to run a three pound spring but you want to run ultimately 30 pounds. So you want your low to be three pounds and then your high to be 30 pounds. Can you do that with the controllers? There's lots of cool stuff to talk about with, with boost controllers um, and wastegates. Like for instance, I did some testing with on, on, you've seen on most of my Y pipes that I've done for various things on the dyno, I have two wastegates on there so that we have control over the boost. And we've run some where I've only run one of those. And, and then I've run one of those with, nothing on nothing on the other gate so the back pressure could theoretically if it got over seven pounds could push that gate open and then we have a different boost curve than if we run another line just to the top of that gate so that that gate will always stay closed so there's a lot of cool things that um, we can show with the different combinations of waste gates and controllers and all that thank you guys all for showing up <laughs> sometimes the waste gate flutters and spits boost out the exhaust uh Mike, let's see how I get some 706 to flow with two, two inch valves. Cool. Um, thank you guys all for showing up. I will see you guys all tomorrow.